beautiful. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 20. Psalm 20. And to begin with, we're going to read the seventh verse. Psalm 20 and verse 7. Eventually, we'll come back and look at all nine verses of this psalm, but to begin with, let's read Psalm 20 and verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us this day. <clears throat> thank you that we have opportunity and freedom, again, to gather together in this house to worship you. Lord, thank you for the freedom we have in general, in our country, in our land, and again, for those who have purchased it. Lord, thank you for Jesus who purchased our soul's salvation, and help us, Lord, to turn our entire attention upon you at this time. Forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your blessing. Lord, help us, strengthen us as Christians to live a faithful life of service to you and a life of witness to others. And, Lord, we pray, again, if there's a soul listening today who doesn't know you as Savior, they may come to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> our coins and our currency have these words on them, in God we trust. Now, that's been a legal national motto of the United States of America since the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower in the 1950s. That may surprise you. That it wasn't earlier than that. Well, it was used earlier than that, but it was officially an act of Congress in 1956 and 57 that that be our official national motto. The phrase was used long before 1956-57. Salmon P. Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury under President Abraham Lincoln. He moved Congress to place this motto on U.S. coins in the 1860s. But then, long before that, and we sang it a while ago, the motto was around. In 1814, Francis Scott Key wrote, Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. Now, I want to take you back a little bit in history. We're going to get into the Bible, but I want to take you back a little bit in history and tell you, that this nation, contrary to some lies that are being told today, this nation was intended to be, always intended to be, a Christian nation. And a few years ago, a very prominent individual in our country, during a speech, made the statement, whatever America once was, it is no longer a Christian nation. Well, that's to our shame. That is certainly to our shame because we ought to be a Christian nation. It was founded to be a Christian nation. Well, I'd, I'd like proof of that. Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm about to give it to you. On July 4th, 1776, 56 members of the Continental Congress declared the 13 colonies of Britain in North America to be 13 free states now called the United States of America. That declaration contains this phrase. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now that marked the beginning and the birth of the nation that has stood among all the nations of the world as an example of what a nation can become when they decide to be free. From the beginning, it was clear that faith in God was a primary principle for this nation. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution named the rights of the people, and I want to share with you the wording of the very first freedom, the one that they put at the top, number one in the Constitution, and here it is. Congress shall make no law re respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now that's the very first 
of the Ten Amendments called the Bill of Rights, and notice the first thing that it mentions. Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion. We do not have in our country an official state church. And we never have had, and praise God, I don't think we ever will have. But a lot of folks like to, these days, like to use what they call the establishment clause. Congress shall make no law regarding the, or respecting the establishment of religion, but they don't like to use the next clause or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There's to be no law that prohibits your free freedom of worship. Now these are the very first rights belonging to citizens and they were written first because they are first in importance. But I want us to go a little bit farther than that. I want to read to you from the 13 original states, the 13 colonies which became the first 13 states. Every one of them had a freedom of religion or freedom of worship clause in their constitution. Some of them are far more explicit than others. If you'll listen carefully, I think some of these may, may surprise you a little bit. Virginia, 1776. That religion, or the duty we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed by reason and conviction, but not by force or violence, and therefore all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion. New York, 1683, that no person or persons which profess faith in God by Jesus Christ shall at any time or by any ways be molested, punished, or disquieted, or called in question for any difference in opinion or matter of religious concernment. Does, does that surprise you, being in New York? Massachusetts, 1780. And every denomination of Christians, demeaning themselves peaceably and as good citizens of the community, shall be equally under the protection of the law. Maryland, 1776. All persons professing the Christian religion are equally entitled to protection in their religious liberty. Delaware, 1776. That all persons professing Christian religion ought forever to enjoy equal rights and privileges in the state. Connecticut, 1818. The exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination shall forever be free to all persons in this state. New Hampshire, 1784. Every individual has a natural and unalienable right to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience. Rhode Island, 1842. Every person shall be free to worship God according to the dictates of such person's religious belief. Georgia, 1789. All persons shall have the free exercise of religion. North Carolina, 1776. All men have a natural and unalienable right to worship Almighty God. South Carolina, 1868 that all persons and religious societies who acknowledge that there is one God and a future state of rewards and punishments and that God is to be publicly worshiped shall, freely, shall be freely tolerated. Pennsylvania, 1790, that all men have a natural and unalienable right to worship Almighty God. New Jersey, 1776, no person shall ever within this colony be deprived of the inestimable privilege of worshiping God Almighty. So it's pretty evident that the people who founded this country believed in God, and more particularly, they were people who believed in Jesus Christ or called themselves Christians. Now, I am not saying that every one of them was a born-again believer. I'm not at all convinced that that would be true, but they certainly were not atheist or secularist. That brings us back to the scriptures. David wrote many, not all, but he wrote many of the Psalms, and he wrote Psalm 20. If you have any trouble finding it, if you had any trouble finding it, go to Psalm 23 and just back up a couple and you'll be there. But Psalm 20 talks about 
faith and country. Now, David, of course, when he wrote this, did not have the United States in mind. There was no United States in David's lifetime, and he wouldn't have even thought about it. He, his thoughts are regarding the country of Israel, where he would later become king. But I think we can take some applications from what David wrote and apply them to our daily life. That's a wonderful thing about the Bible. No matter what country you're from, no matter what uh, culture you're from, you can find truth in the Bible that's applicable to your life. So look with me, if you will, at Psalm 20 and verse 1. Psalm 20, verse 1 says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. So it's David's desire for all those who read this psalm that the Lord, and it's in all capital letters there if you notice that, that is the salvation name of God. It is to say the Lord who is the Savior will hear you in time of trouble. Call out to the Lord when you're in trouble. Call out to him when you have need and he will hear you and he will answer you. And then he said, the God of Jacob will defend you in time of trouble. Now, that's another interesting point, the God of Jacob. I heard a, listened to a very interesting discussion yesterday on radio, and the topic of the discussion was, do, do Christians, Jews, and uh, Islamists, Muslims, worship the same God? Well, there, the many people would say, yes, it's the same God, different approaches to the same God. But if you read carefully the Quran, and if you read carefully the Bible, you're going to find that Allah of the Quran is not the God of the Bible. Well, in what ways is he different? Well, let's look at this one. The name of the God of Jacob, defend thee. The Quran does teaches that Isaac was not the son of the promise to Abraham, that Ishmael was. Therefore, the God of Jacob would not be the God of the Quran. Jacob being the son of Isaac. So there's a difference there. There are other differences, but that's, that's far enough, I think, to settle the question. Then you come to verse 2, and David says, God will send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. So David's desire is that the Lord will send you help from the sanctuary. What's the sanctuary? That means his, the place of worship. Now in David's time, that would have been at Shiloh. That would have been the old tabernacle, the one that Moses built many years before David was ever born. And then later in Solomon's reign and, and afterwards, there was a temple in Jerusalem. But the sanctuary is talking about, the Lord will send you help from the sanctuary. He prays that you'll be strengthened from the sanctuary or the place to worship God. Now, we, again, need to be thankful that we have the freedom to worship God, and we need to exercise that freedom. We need to come and worship God. And those of you gathered here this morning, obviously you've come to do that. But David goes on to say that you'll be strengthened from the sanctuary, strengthened out of Zion. Zion is the holy mountain, uh, the mountain where Jerusalem is, but in uh, Psalms and other portions of Scripture, it really is talking about heaven, that you'll be worship, or, or strengthened rather from God himself, from the dwelling place of God. And then in verse 3, he says, Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. His prayer is that you'll remember all the offerings you've given, that God will remember your, your offerings, but you'll remember your offerings as well. And think about it. Well, sometimes uh, say, well, preacher, you say put something in the plate, and I put my $5 or 10 or whatever in the plate, and that's my offering. Well, good. Do you think about it? No, I just kind of do it. Well, you ought to think about it. As I mentioned earlier in prayer, that is part of our worship, giving back to God some of that with which he has blessed us. Now, he's told us to do that. And it's really not an unreasonable request when you think about it. 
just to return to the Lord some of the blessings that he's given to you. He doesn't ask for all of it. What he asks all of is all of your heart. He asks for all of your heart, all of your love, all of your devotion. He doesn't ask for all of your money. Well, wouldn't the money go with it? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? You know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it does say a great deal about what your priorities are. Years ago, there was a book, and, and they did a little movie about it, about a man named Stanley Tam. <clears throat> the book and the movie were both called God Owns My Business. Stanley Tam uh, discovered a way when they used to, not how they do it now digitally, but when they used to take photographs on photographic film and then develop it, there was silver in the process. And Stanley Tim discovered a process that to take the developing fluid and recover the silver out of it and reuse the silver. Sound like a good idea? It does, doesn't it? Well, it was a great idea and it worked well for him. Stanley Tam was a Christian, and so he began to tithe everything from his business, reclaiming silver from the photographic process, to the Lord. His business continued to grow. After a while, he said, you know what? We're doing so well. I'm going to give God 90%, and we're going to operate on the 10%. And he did that, and his business continued to grow. After a while... He went to a lawyer, had the papers drawn up, and he said 100% of the profits belong to God. All of it. He gave it all to God. So that's not a true story. Look it up. Look it up. Stanley Tam, God owns my business. He did that. Now, what am I saying to you? Am I telling you to do that? I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you to be thankful and consider the offerings that you give to the Lord and then accept the burnt sacrifice. The burnt sacrifice obviously is a total commitment. Uh, it's kind of like the old story. The difference between uh, a contribution and a commitment. You take a breakfast of ham and eggs. For the chicken, that's a contribution. For the pig, that's a commitment. Now you understand the difference, don't you? Now, here's the thing. He says, remember the Lord, or the Lord will remember all your offerings. And he ends the verse with Selah. You see that word a lot in the Psalms. And Selah is a signal for the singer. All of the Psalms were written to be sung. It's really a signal for the singer to stop and take a breath and pause for a moment before going to the next verse. But it's also a signal to us to stop, check our surroundings, and meditate upon God's word. And some have taken this word to mean forever. So shall it be forever. Similar to the word amen, which amen means be it ever so. So it's similar to amen, but it's not the same word. You'll find the word amen in scripture also. But selah, it's a time to pause and meditate and think about what you've just read. Then in verse 4 he says, "Grant The Lord grant thee according to thine own heart, and fulfill all thy counsel. Now that's important, because the Lord is going to grant you according to your own heart. David's son Solomon, in writing the Proverbs, wrote, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine understanding." And he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, John writes in 1 John, says, Whatsoever you shall ask, he will give it to you. If we ask anything according to his will, he'll give it to you. Now there's a key phrase there, according to his will. If your heart is right with God, he's going to answer your prayers. He's going to give you what you desire when you desire the right thing. Our problem is sometimes we get caught up with greed or we get caught up with selfishness and we don't desire the right thing. But as long as our desires are honorable and godly and right, he says he'll grant them to us. Well, I don't know, preacher. I wanted something I thought was a really good thing and, and, and the Lord didn't give it to me. Well, maybe 
he had knew something that you don't i've had that happen in my life where i prayed for something what i prayed for didn't happen and looking back on it i'm glad it didn't happen but because that didn't happen but something better did happen that i had no idea about and i've seen that more than once i could tell you some stories about that but then in verse 5 David says, we will rejoice in thy salvation. We will rejoice in the name of our God, and we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. What it's saying here, what David is saying here, we'll rejoice together in salvation. We ought to rejoice in our salvation. We ought to sing together. That's why we come to sing hymns where we're praising God for his salvation. We start the service each Sunday morning with praise God from whom all blessings flow we rejoice together in salvation and then we name the name of God in honor and we set up banners now what did we do we set up banners here's a banner here the banner of freedom our American flag but over there is the Christian flag and we set up banners just as the Bible tells us to do so we rejoice in our salvation, we rejoice in the name of our God, and we will set up banners, and the Lord will fulfill all our petitions. And I want you to know and understand that uh, God is interested in what you care about and what you pray, and he plans to answer, the. he promises to answer the prayers of his children. Then in verse 6, David says, Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. So the Lord saves those who trust in him. That's, that's the primary idea behind this phrase. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. David was anointed. He was going to be king. He knows the Lord saved him, but he has saved you too if you put your trust in him. The Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven and with saving strength of his right hand. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You call on him, you trust him, he'll save you. He's promised to do that. You can count on that. And then that brings us to verse 6. Uh, I'm sorry, that was verse 6. Come to verse 7. Verse 6 is where we get the idea of salvation by grace through faith. Verse 7, he says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. When I was a young Christian, I, uh, I've always loved automobiles all my life. And I had my first car about before I was a Christian, but when I became a Christian, I thought a lot of my car. And I'll be honest with you, I, I probably thought a little too much of my car. And somebody brought this verse to me, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. I was convicted by that verse because I, I thought a little too much of the car. I, I, I love the Lord, I want to serve the Lord, but I thought a little too much of the car. And I was in a revival service. The evangelist was Michael Guido, probably not a name that most of you would know. He had a radio broadcast for many years called The Sower. And uh, he was an excellent, excellent Bible teacher and evangelist. Michael Guido uh, preached and he talked about surrendering fully to the Lord. And I came forward at the invitation, and I talked with Brother Guido, and I said, I feel like the Lord would have me give my car to him. But how do I go about doing that? And Michael Guido said, you use it. You use it to bring people to church. So you know what? I did that. I did that. Now, did you bring people to church with it? Yes. Now understand, the car had four seats in it. it. had bucket seats in the front, had bucket seats in the back. I got 11 people in it to come to church. You, you did. Yeah. Was that legal? Probably not. Uh, there are no seatbelt laws in those days. 
So I got 11 people in it to come to church. Now, later on, I got a bigger car. I got a Chevrolet station wagon. And Chevrolet station wagon could hold more people, right? You think so? Sure. I got 29 people in the Chevrolet station wagon to come to church. You didn't do that. I did. Uh, was it a lot for the car? It was a lot. I went around the corner and one of my hubcaps popped off as I went around the corner. The truth of the matter is, say, that you're crazy, probably, but I was trying to do what I was thought was what the Lord wanted me to do. I was going to use my car for God's service. Now, I had, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I back up on that. I got the, the four-seater car. I got 16 people in that. Later on, I had a Camaro. It's smaller than the station wagon. I got 11 people in that one. Got 16 in the four-seater. Got 11 in the Camaro. So it must have been awfully crowded. It was very uncomfortable. But we got people to church. So what happened after that? Well, I talked the church into getting a bus. It made sense, huh? <laughs> you think? Okay, and we got buses, and we started using buses bringing people to church. What are you getting at? I'm getting at take what you have and use it. Now, I'm not telling you to do crazy things like I've done. I'm telling you to take what you have and give it to the Lord and let the Lord use you. So you didn't ever get a ticket or anything? Never did. Do you think you could have? Probably, but never happened. Did anybody ever get hurt? No, thank God they didn't. But they did get to church, and we were happy to get them there. The verse says, some trust in chariots. Some trust in chariots. Some trust, maybe not your trust isn't in a vehicle. Maybe your trust is in something else some other material thing you think it's going to get you through it's going to save you some trust in horses some trust in the strength of armies and I thank God for our military don't misunderstand me but can I share something with you and I, I'm not trying to pronounce any ill on our military please know that but the greatest armies in the world have lost battles they have at the time of the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 that we talked about, Britain had the largest navy in the world in both of those situations and the largest army in the world. But they didn't win those battles. Oh, they, uh, I should say they won a few battles in those wars, but they didn't win the wars. The Roman army was at one time the greatest army on earth, but the Roman army was defeated. We could go on with that, but I think you have the idea. The fact of the matter is, we ought to thank God for our military. We ought to thank God for those who serve. And we ought to thank those who serve. But we ought not put all our faith in them. We ought not put all our faith in vehicles. We ought, some put their trust in the strength of nature. You know, nature is going to take care of everything. Nature won't do anything that God doesn't direct it to do. You need to understand that. Notice what the verse says. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. What we need to do is trust the Lord himself if we are to be saved. We need to trust the Lord himself if we are to have freedom. We trust the Lord himself if we are to have liberty. We need to trust the Lord himself if things are going to be right. I've said this here before, and I've said it often. I believe you ought to vote. You have the right to vote in this country, and I think you ought to exercise that vote. I vote every election there is, I vote. National elections, state elections, county elections, city elections, whatever, if, if there's a chance to vote, I vote. And people you vote for always win? No, not always, sometimes they do. But I still vote. I don't give up on the process, and you shouldn't either. You ought to vote. And you ought to vote, as we read, according to the dictates of your own conscience. You ought to vote for the people and the things that you believe are right. Not just because it's one party or another, but because of what's right and what's true. You ought to vote. 
well, I don't really know who these candidates are and I don't even know what the issues are. Well, then educate yourself. You can do that. Most of you, not all of you, but most of you have access to a computer. You can use that and you can get educated as to what the, who the candidates are and what the issues are. For example, if there's an, an election coming up, there isn't one right now, not soon, but if an election coming up, you can go to the county supervisor elections office on the internet. You can see everything that's gonna be on the ballot, who the candidates are, what the issues are, and from there, you can go to the various websites of those candidates, or you can look up those issues and you can learn what it's all about. Then you can vote intelligently, according to what you believe is right. And I strongly urge you to do that. But I, I'm, I've said this many times here too, if we vote for all the right things, and if we vote for all the right people, whatever you think the right things the right people are, whoever comes to your mind when you say that, that is not going to save our nation. It's not gonna save us as a society. Why not? If we've got good people leading and we're voting for the right thing, I'll tell you why. Because we need God. We cannot trust in human strength alone. We have to put our trust in God. And that's why the motto of this country is in God we trust. It is not in strength we trust. It is not even in morality we trust. It is in God we trust. And what we need more than anything in this country is a genuine spiritual revival. We need a wholesale turning back to the Lord. We've edged God out of society. It was never meant to be. I think you understand. By the way, what I didn't read to you from those different colonies which became states, some of them had the requirement in those same constitutions, I just didn't read you this portion of it, that for a person to hold office in that country, to be the governor or hold any, any public office in that country, they had, uh, um, I'm sorry, in that colony or that state, they had to profess to be a Christian. Really? Yeah, they did. They had to profess to be a Christian. Well, why is that? Do they hate everybody else? No, they didn't hate everybody else. They knew that if their leaders were Christians, they would have, or should have, people of character leading them and people who cared about the spiritual nature of the, the state and the colony. Folks, that's not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable at all. Say, well, I think, you know, somebody may be wise and may have good ideas that's not a Christian. Well, that, I wouldn't argue that point with you. I mean, there are people who are wise and have good ideas who are not Christians. But we have to go beyond just wisdom and good ideas, and we have to consider the spiritual nature of things. And those who are spiritually right with God are going to take you in the right direction. Human wisdom will carry us so far, but not far enough. And so... It says some trust in chariots, some trust in the, the strength of armies, some trust in horses. Horses are known for their strength, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So important. I was watching an old TV show recently. Why was I watching an old TV show? Because I don't watch new TV shows. But anyway, watch an old TV show, and this will surprise some of you, but it was a Western. And, uh, and uh, some people were in trouble and they needed to tie a rope on and pull them out. And the hero of the, the show tied a rope around these two people and he's pulling them out. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, you got a horse right over there. Why are you pulling them? Like, tie them on the horse, let the horse pull them out. You know, horse a lot stronger than a man is. But for whatever reason, they didn't do it that way. I guess show he was the hero, I'm not sure. But some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now we've come to a point, and it's not new, it's not something that just happened in the last year. We've come to a point in our life, in our national life, where we don't want people to pray in public. And if they pray in public, do not mention Jesus. Do not mention Jesus anywhere. Our country wasn't started that way. I, I read to you how the 
state of New York's original charter said that they granted freedom to worship Jesus Christ. It was very clear. And I remind you, as I just said a few minutes ago, several of them, not all of them, but several of these states required that to be to hold public office, a person had to profess to be a Christian. Now, they never put a denominational tag on that, and they wouldn't have, but they said you had to profess to be a Christian. So the fact of the matter is we've lost that. We've turned away from it. We've turned away from God, and again, that's not a new thing. It it's started a long time ago before some of the people in this room were even born. But it's carried us to where we are today. I want to throw in something else here. It's not in my notes, but it's something that I think is worth bringing up right now. Back more than a century ago, this is 2021, uh, back around 1900, a group of men led by R.A. Torrey, who was successor to D.L. Moody at the Moody Bible Institute and a great evangelist in his own right, Torrey wrote many books, but he got a, a committee of men together who were Christians, and they wrote a series of four books, and the four books were sold in a set, and the title of the book was The Fundamentals, and what it was about, these men were, that, that Torrey got together were from different denominations, but they believed certain things were true, and they said this is the fundamentals of Christianity, this is what Christians believe, regardless of den denomination, this is what Christians believe. What were those fundamentals? One, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Two, the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Three, the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. Four, that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the only hope of salvation, and it's by grace through faith in him. And the bodily resurrection of Jesus and the virgin birth of Jesus and the promised return of Jesus. They said this is what all Christians believe. Now you, you may vary on other things. They didn't get into those other things but they said this is what Christians believe and they wrote this four volume set outlining that. Back in the 1990s I'm pretty sure it was uh, the publisher put out a new version of that, uh, taken out some of the old writings and put in some newer writings and created a one volume, one book called The Fundamentals. And I'm going to tell you, read the old version, not the new version. Okay, The old one is much better. The new one's a little bit watered down, to tell you the truth. Even though some people that I highly respect had something to do with creating that one volume version, they, they weakened it. I bring that up to tell you this. When they wrote that four volume set of books back in 1900, they looked at the trends of their day. Now they could not see the future. They weren't prophets. They just looked at the direction things were headed. Now you do that all the time. You get in your car and you start down the road and you're going at a certain speed and you'll look at it and you say, well, you, you know where you want to arrive and you figure out if I drive this speed, and I, I'll be at my destination at a certain time. Everybody does that. So they looked at the trends of their day. Understand, around 1900, they looked at the trends of the 1800s and the beginning of the new century, and they said, if we continue the path we're traveling now, by the end of the 20th century, America will no longer be based on Judeo-Christian philosophy. It will be based on an Eastern religious philosophy. And you know what? They were exactly right. They were exactly right. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying we need to get back to the fundamentals. We need to get back. By the way, that four-volume set of books, that's where the term fundamentalist come from. I, I know today, because of our news media, fundamentalist means some wacko nut that's going to plant a bomb somewhere or something. That, that's, that's not right. That's not right. It's those who believe in the foundational or fundamental doctrines of Christianity. That's a fundamentalist. We don't. 
throw that term out a lot these days because people get the wrong idea. They think, yeah, you're, you're some crazy terrorist. No, nope. no, nope, not at all. We don't advocate violence. We don't advocate uh, any of that sort of thing. But the, the weapons of our warfare are spiritual, not carnal. But I want to share this with you, and this is so important that you know and understand this. We need to get back to the basics of Christianity, and we need a revival where our country gets back to the basics of Christianity. It was founded upon the basics of Christianity, and we need to get back to the basics of Christianity. We need to believe the Bible. We need to stop questioning the Bible and just believe the Bible. Just read it and believe it. Now, I say stop questioning. I don't mean don't read it and say, well, I don't understand that part. Try to find the answer. You find the answer if you look for it. You will. We need to get back to believing the Bible. We need to get back to trusting the Bible. We need to get back to honoring Jesus Christ. We need to understand that the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection are essential doctrines. The deity of Christ is an essential doctrine. We need to understand these things. Salvation by grace through faith is an essential doctrine. There's some things you can compromise on, some things you can't. Well, what kind of things can you compromise on? Well, I'll tell you what. I only know of one other church in Delray Beach. And maybe there is more than one more, but I only know of one more church in Delray Beach that has a Sunday evening service. But where in the Bible does it say, thou shalt have a Sunday evening service? It doesn't. It doesn't say that. So if a church decides not to have a Sunday evening service, does that mean they've gone into doctrinal error? Not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. We're not saying that. Then why do you do it? Because we believe it's right. We believe it's the thing to do. We believe that you need at least three times a week to get together to really thrive spiritually. And something else that probably most people don't think about. If you look around you, a little bit earlier in the service, several people left and went next door. What are they doing? They're over there working with the children. When do they get to go to church, sit down? Well, it's not Sunday morning, is it? No, it's Sunday evening. They get, to, they get to have church. Does that make sense to you? Sure. And there are other people that it works well for them to come to Sunday evening service, and I encourage you to do that. But again, you're not violating Scripture if, if your church doesn't have a Sunday evening service. But you're violating scripture if you don't believe the scripture. You're violating scripture if you don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You're violating scripture if you don't believe in his deity, his virgin birth, his bodily resurrection. You're violating scriptures if you don't hold to those things. Because you're changing what the Bible itself teaches. So we need to be different than the world. We need to remember the name of the Lord our God. And we need to get back to God and we need a spiritual revival. Now in the history of this country there have been periods of great spiritual revival. During the colonial period, just before the revolution, there was what was called the Great Awakening, a tremendous spiritual revival. It started with a, uh, one Presbyterian congregation and then spread through the colonies. Many years later there was what they called the Second Great Awakening. And then years after that, during, and this may surprise you, but during the American Civil War, there was a great revival, spiritual revival. And it was men like D.L. Moody who picked up on that and continued it afterwards. Why was there a spiritual revival in the Civil War? Because both sides came to realize that they needed God. And that they, this fighting among themselves wasn't going to be the answer that they needed God. other times of great national stress there have been revival after September 11 2001 there was a short period of revival and it didn't last long it didn't last long there was a revival of patriotism there was a revival of people getting back into church and so forth but it it was short lived and I could give you a good explanation why it was so short lived but we'll not take time for that this morning But that is exactly what our country needs. Now, 
Preacher, you saying it doesn't matter who we vote for? No, I'm not saying it does matter who you vote for, but I'm saying voting, as important as it is, isn't enough. We've got to get down to the spiritual nature of things, and we've got to understand that the heart is what has to be reached. So David says, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And verse 8 says, they are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. What is he talking about there? The unbeliever will fail, ultimately. They may have great success for a time, but it's temporary. Those who know the Lord, those who are risen together with him, those who, who will stand with him, they are going to be with him forever. Then finally in verse 9, Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. Now, that's a prayer of David's heart. He calls upon the Lord, again in all capital letters, the salvation name of God. He says, Lord, save us. Save us. Again, Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you have to call on him in faith. That's verse 13. Verses 9 and 10 before that says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So some will name the name of the Lord. They'll say, I'm a Christian, but they've not placed their faith and trust in him. Was well, there a difference? All the difference of eternity. I've heard this many times, but I just heard a fellow on the radio say it just the other day. I hadn't heard anybody say this in a long time. He said, many people miss heaven by the distance between the head and the heart. They know in their head what's true and what's right but they haven't trusted the Lord in their heart. And that's precisely what it says has to be done. So he says, save, Lord. Let the king hear us when we call, the king being the, uh, the Lord himself. In that hymn we sang a while ago, my country tis of thee. Notice the last line says, great God our king. Who's the king? God. God is our king. And we need to get back to that. We need to understand that. We need to act as though that's true. The Lord has sent us messages. I wish God would speak to me. Well, he has. He's given you the Bible. He has spoken to you. You want to hear from God? You ought to read your Bible. You pray. He hears you when you pray. He'll answer you in, your, in the Bible. You think so? I know so. Let the Lord send you messages and then listen to what he says to you about his love for you. Listen to what he says to you about the service he wants you to do and how to live a life that's connected to him. That's all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. Well, I want God to tell me what to do day by day. Well, tell you what. God does tell us what to do in the Bible. There are places in the Bible where it says thou shalt. If it says thou shalt, then that's what you ought to do. There are places in the Bible where it says, Thou shalt not. When it says, Thou shalt not, that's what you shouldn't do. Well, let's go farther. There are places in the Bible where it says, For such is the will of God, or this is the will of God concerning you. Well, guess what? That is the will of God for you. Pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't tell me everything like, Should I, I, I want to buy a certain item. Should, should I go to Walmart or should I go somewhere else? It doesn't tell me that. No, it doesn't tell you things like that. Because if it did tell you every little thing like that, the Bible would be so thick you'd never be able to read it all. God gives you the principles and allows you to make your own decisions. And the truth of the matter is, whether you're going to buy that item at Walmart or not, I'm not saying that's not important. It might be important, particularly financially important for you. But what I'm saying to you is, if you'll follow the Lord and you'll let the Lord lead you through his word and by his spirit, you won't have to search to know God's will. You'll already be living God's will, and he'll guide you within his will. And that's such an important 
thing to understand. So now we come to the conclusion of the whole matter, as Solomon says. Where do you put your trust today? Is your trust in God? Or is your trust in government? I'm not preaching against government. Not what I'm saying. But do you trust God primarily or do you trust government? Do you trust in God or do you trust in chariots? Do you trust in God or do you trust in horses? Do you trust in God or do you trust in material things? Do you trust in God or do you trust your own wisdom? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. We quoted this a while ago. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Because you'll have the right desires. Next question. Do you know the Savior? Do the, you know that you've been born again? Do you know that you've been saved? If you closed your eyes for the last time. Breathed your last breath. Where would your soul be for eternity? If you say, well, I think it would be in heaven, but you're not sure about that, you need to make sure. And you need to understand that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And what he asks us to do is believe that he paid for our sins and trust him to forgive our sins. And he promises to grant us eternal life. Number three, will you pray for a revival in our country? Pray for the leaders of our country. The Bible tells us to do that. Well, I, you know, I, I, I didn't vote for the people in office. That's not what it's about. You know, when the men who wrote the New Testament wrote the New Testament, they were not under godly leaders. And yet, what, is, what do they write? Fear God and honor the king. Who was the king when that was written? Caesar. And Caesar was just such a, a wonderful, godly individual who loved Christians? No, absolutely not. But it said, fear God and honor the king. We need to honor and respect government. We need to honor and respect law. We need to do that. But we need to pray. Pray for those in leadership over you. Pray for the city council. I don't even know who they are. Find out who they are and pray for them. Pray for the mayor. Pray for the county commission. Pray for the state legislature. Pray for the governor. Pray for the president. Pray for the vice president. Pray for those in Congress. Pray for these people. Well, what am I supposed to pray? Well, number one, it would be good to pray for them to be saved, wouldn't it? That would be a great place to start. And then number two, pray for them to have wisdom and make wise decisions because their decisions affect all the rest of us. Pray for them. And so you, you think some of those people get saved? Listen, everybody who's not saved needs to be saved. It's that plain and simple. So if you are a born-again Christian, there was a time when you were not. So was there a chance of you being saved? Well, obviously there was. So you pray for other people to be saved. Pray for your governmental leaders to be saved. So well, I, I'm thinking of somebody who's a governmental leader. I don't think they'll ever get saved. But what a testimony would it be if they did? Wouldn't that be a miracle? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I, I don't think God's going to do that. Well, if you don't think God's going to do that, then maybe he won't. But if you pray in faith believing, he might. I talked to a preacher years ago from Miami, and we had a, a governor. I won't mention his name right now. Some of you would remember him. Many of you are too young to remember. And a governor was not a terrible governor, but he was not known to be a godly man either. And this preacher in Miami said that he got to meet one-on-one -on -one with the governor and that he shared the gospel with him, and the governor trusted the Lord as his Savior. Now, did that governor trust the Lord? I hope so. I hope so. Say, well, what happened after that? Did things greatly change? No, I'll tell you what. Shortly before he had finished his second term, election had already been held, new governor had already been elected, he died. So is his soul in heaven? I trust so. 
I trust so. What are you saying? I'm saying, was it important to pray for that man's soul? Was it important for that Miami preacher to talk to him? It sure was. It sure was. Now, understand this. Listen to what the Lord has to say to you. Pray for a revival in our country. And then the last question, will you serve him with the best that you have at your disposal? Will you serve God with the best that you have? Like Stanley Tam, give everything to God? Well, start with giving your heart to God. That'd be the place to start. And then let the Lord lead you from there. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you so much for blessing us today. Thank you for each and every soul who's present here today. And Lord, it is my prayer that you'd bless and help each of us to be thankful, first of all, for the freedom that we have. And again, to be thankful for those who have purchased our freedom, many at the sacrifice of their own lives. Lord, we do pray for our governmental leaders. We pray for their soul salvation. We pray that they would have wisdom to make right decisions and not wrong decisions. And Lord, we pray that they would take the direction that you would have them to take rather than following the desires of man. Lord, we pray for a revival in our country. We pray for a revival in our state. We pray for a revival in our county. We pray, Lord, for a revival in our city. We pray, Lord, for a revival in our church. We pray, Lord, for a revival in our hearts. Let us turn our hearts wholly to you. Now, Lord, I pray if there's a soul listening today who doesn't know you as Savior, that they would open their heart and they would trust you. They would call on you, knowing that you love them, knowing that you are the Son of God, knowing that you paid for their sins at the cross, and trusting you to forgive their sins, and know that they have a home in heaven guaranteed by your resurrection. Then, Lord, for those who already know you, Help us to grow spiritually. Help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to be the men and women that you'd have us to be. Help us to be the witnesses and testimonies that you want us to be. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.